things and they tried cutting them up and you know what you end up with is lots of these starfish arms which then propagate themselves and regrow. Because that's right, they, they, they actually can do that. You, yes. It's not, I'm going to cut you up, that's it, your history. No. They... Cut it in half, it makes two starfish. So today we have the, I call it the dreaded crown of thorns starfish. <laughs> um, and the expert on that is Dr. David Williamson, who joins us here today. So Dave, welcome and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Eleanor. So... Crown of Thorns is very much your area. You head the mm -hmm. Crown of Thorns or, or COTS control program with the authority. Yes. And we're going to, we've got a whole list of questions that people generally ask about Crown of Thorns. But I thought we might just start off with, um, you know, here we, we say we want people to see the reef. We want them to love the reef mm. and to do whatever they can in their lives to protect the reef. So to yeah. start off with, what is it that made you fall in love with the Great Barrier Reef? Well, um, you know, we've got this incredible ecosystem out here. It is absolutely a world-class asset, you know, and it's, it's World Heritage listed and it's, it's universally outstanding. Um, so I grew up in Western Australia and um, over there in the Indian Ocean, it's a very different system, but we do have coral reefs on the coast and I did get experience getting in the water and, and looking at things and I was involved in free diving and scuba diving and fishing and spear fishing and everything from a very young age and and i always thought you know the barrier reef was at that time pre-internet um was a sort of almost mythical place that you know this incredibly see the odd photo um, from the reef at the time and um i just thought i've got to get over there at some point and check that out and um lo and behold i i did well enough at school to you know qualify to do a do a marine science degree and moved here to do that in 1993 and you know, my first experience of the reef was actually jumping on the old um, Magnetic Island car barge and heading over to Jeffrey Bay. And it happened to be a beautiful glass out day, clear water, clear sky. And uh, I jumped in the water and did a full length swim of the reef crest at Jeffrey Bay. And uh, it's a green zone. It's one of the no tape protected areas. And just that and seeing the coral that was there at Jeffrey Bay at that time. Um, was outstanding and that just got me hooked right from day one. Yeah, that's something that most of the people we've spoken to have said it's that first moment of yeah. putting your head underwater on the reef and just seeing the amazing life that's there. It is. It's incredible. And, and you know, the fact that that's a marine reserve and it had been protected since the late 1980s, that particular place, and it's got the Mulkey shipwreck sitting right there at the end of the reef, reef flat. Um, and it, so it's full of fish and at the time it was just loaded with coral. And to see that on a nice clear day where it was probably eight or ten metres visibility in the water and it was just, it was, I was hooked. And so from that moment you were hooked, you studied marine science and mm. you've been working around coral reefs ever since? Yeah, much. mostly coral reefs um, and particularly my research work, um, you know, sort of spun up both through private sector consulting and through academic research at the university. Um, and so I sort of, you know, through the early 2000s was doing a lot of that and finished up my PhD in 2009. Um, and yeah, my main focus for my research was really on the effects of the marine park zoning plan on the ecology of the reef. So what, I mean, obviously that's been a huge part of what the Reef Authority has done in managing the reef. It's, mm. it's um, absolutely recognised as mm. critical. Mm. What's that like as a student? studying that and then mm. being involved in working with the organisation that implemented it? It was pretty awesome and I saw it as an incredible opportunity for myself and, and actually quite a privilege um, to do what I was doing. Um, yeah, and when I graduated from my, my bachelor's degree in 1996, there was 35 of us that graduated in that year, 33 or 34, somewhere in that. Nowadays at JCU at that same bach you know, bachelor degree, the, you've got about 130, 100 to 150 graduates a year. And a lot of them are international students uh, coming from all parts of the world to study what we have here uh, and to experience the, the quality of teaching that we have at JCU in Townsville. Um, but so I was part of quite a small cohort of people at the time. And so it was quite privileged that we had a few people from Papua New Guinea, a few from Fiji, a couple of people from the US um, and a couple of Europeans. But it was nothing like you've got now with all the huge numbers of international students. Um, so it was a very different sort of time and as I said you know we didn't have the internet we didn't have YouTube we didn't weren't seeing videos all the time of all these incredible places around the world you really had to get out there and see it for yourself or what you saw in coffee table books or our textbooks so to get out there and do it um, and then to do all of that years of work that I did out there 
uh, was an absolute privilege and an honour. Um, and so in my way to both appreciate and enjoy the ecosystem that we've got here, but also to make a contribution towards understanding it and understanding how we can manage it more effectively, um, that was a huge honour and, and privilege. Yeah, no, you just introduced that concept of management. Mm. Um, if we go a few decades into the future, mm. um, you now head the Crown of Thorns Starfish Control Program yep. with the Reef Authority. What is, the, like, the number one question that people seem to ask when we talk about COTS is, what are Crown of Thorns Starfish mm. and do we hate them? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we definitely don't hate them. Um, you know, they are they are a native part of this ecosystem. They, they're here. They've evolved here with the coral and with the fish and with everything else. Um, so they're a natural part of the ecosystem, but they do become a problem, kind of a pest species, when they reach what we refer to as outbreak numbers. So when they outbreak, um, there can be thousands of them on an individual reef, and we've got over 3,000 reefs out there. Um, so we're talking about millions of crown of thorn starfish in the system when they're at outbreak densities. When they're at low numbers, um, they feed on coral. They're voracious coral predators, but they, they eat about, about half to their entire body size per day at peak times of year. At some times of the year where it's cooler and they're not getting ready to spawn, they don't need to eat as much. Um, and they eat a little bit less than that. But they eat quite a lot and they feed on live coral tissue. So when we have outbreak densities, they can really turn a reef from essentially equivalent of a rainforest to a car park. Yeah, because that was something, as a kid, I, I didn't grow up anywhere yeah. near the reef. Yeah. But I do remember that crown of thorns were, there was like this evil creature that was yeah. coming down and we were told that it was eating the reef and, mm -hmm. and that was it. I mean, that's yeah. probably from watching... Yeah, BTN or something like yeah. that. In Which Crane was a great show. Yeah. And so that was that was the sort of idea that we had around Crown of Thorns, that yeah. they were this ultimate killing machine. Is mm. that what they are to the reef? Well, they're amazing predators, like you know, on coral. Um, and they grow very, very quickly. Um, and they're the world's fastest starfish. So they can eat a coral, go and hide for a bit, and when they're hungry again, quickly move to another coral, eat that one, hide for a bit, move to another coral. So they can cause a lot of a lot of damage and certainly in parts of the world where they are not managed um, they are a huge problem and they compound upon um, the impacts that we see from coral bleaching events from cyclone events from overfishing from destructive fishing practices so luckily in the great barrier reef we've got this incredibly well managed marine park and to some degree the park is the the actual zoning plan is doing good things for cots outbreak dynamics right so we we see fewer outbreaks in places that are closed to fishing, the green zones. Um, and we also see overall lower numbers of crown of thorn starfish in green zones um, relative to their sort of neighboring reefs where we fish. Um, and we think the main mechanism there is that we've, um, we've depleted predatory fish stocks um, and other things like triton snails, things that will feed on crown of thorn starfish, particularly when they're juveniles and subadults. Um, and by you know, knocking those fish stocks down, we've reduced the predation pressure on, on the starfish themselves. So that may be one of the mechanisms that contributing towards them reaching outbreak densities. There's also input from the land and nutrient enrichment of our Great Barrier Reef Lagoon, which may impact the, um, the survivorship of the crown of thorn starfish larvae where in the plankton drifting around. So there's a few theories and um, some pretty strong linkages. But um, the evidence at this point suggests that the Marine Park Zoning Plan is doing a great thing for COTS, con for COTS control on its own, and then what we're doing with the COTS control program is actually amplifying the benefits of the COTS control program, uh, of the zoning plan, by actually strategically targeting and culling those starfish. So David, you head up the COTS control program at the Reef Authority. Mm -hmm. Just if you could give us an idea, what actually is the program? Mm -hmm. So the, the Crown of Thorns Starfish Program uh, has been running since 2012 and it's been a general sort of ramp up since then. Um, so we've got more vessels on the water now than we've had. Uh, we have more capacity on the water in terms of dive teams. Uh, and essentially what we do is we have teams of contracted vessels and teams of divers deployed to reefs that we assign, high value reefs throughout the marine park. When they arrive at a reef 
they actually do the initial surveillance of a reef using a mandatory methodology, survey method. They then direct the cull effort and put their dive teams in and move through those sites. Um, so essentially that's the operational part of the COPS control pro program at a higher level. We are working closely with our uh, industry and research partners to deliver um, broad roof protection uh, outcomes for the park. So the, the main objective of the COPS control program is actually to protect coral. It's not to eradicate Cranathon starfish from the park or to reduce their numbers to zero. We're essentially reducing them only far enough to the point where coral growth can outpace the rate at which it's being eaten by the starfish. And we're doing that across hundreds of reefs. And by protecting those important reefs, we're able to secure uh, important sources of coral larvae, which then are dispersed from those reefs and replenish the surrounding reefs. So that's the idea in the long term is that the COTS control program is specifically deploying control program effort, diver effort, to suppress starfish and protect coral. And the, the program itself has just had its funding renewed so you can yep. continue into the future there? Yeah, that's right. Um, through the government's um, $1.2 billion reef protection package that was announced in 2022, um, the COTS control program was awarded $161 odd million dollars um, to carry us through to 2030. Um, so in that time, um, we are looking to see really positive coral protection outcomes from the program. We're, we're doing a, a great job of monitoring it uh, and we're working closely with our partners at the Institute of Marine Science and the Reef Joint Field Management Program to demonstrate the outcomes of the program in terms of the coral protection. So what will that funding actually enable the program to do going forwards? Well, it enables us to deploy enough effort to actually get on top of COTS outbreaks on hundreds of reefs. Um, and to do that, we need to have extremely good quality assurance, training, all of the stuff that we have to do to ensure that the operators are out there doing the best job that they possibly can. We also need to have the data systems in place. We need to have the management systems in place in our end to do that. And we need to have the reporting systems in place. So all of those components of the program have to come together for successful delivery. But ultimately what we're trying to do is end up with more coral on the reef than we would have had we not suppressed these starfish outbreaks. So that's really, I guess, the question being, what does success of the program look like for the reef? Yeah, the success of the program is that we get through what's predicted to be a pretty tough rest of this decade and beyond uh, and still have viable populations of coral on a lot of the reefs that we're actioning with the COTS control program. So it's, it's not just actions that we're taking today for today. We are looking at that long term. This is a long term program and it builds upon some of the other foundational management systems that we have, including the Marine Park Zoning Plan. So most people, when they talk to us, want to know why we're not absolutely wiping out Crownathon mm -hmm. starfish. Yeah. Um, why is our, um, our goal not total eradication? Is there a role for the crown of thorn starfish within the reef ecosystem? Do they actually play a part? Absolutely, they do. Um, they've evolved over millions of years with coral. Then they're a native part of the, the ecosystem. Um, and there are certain types of coral that grow very quickly and colonize space very quickly. So crown of thorn starfish help to kind of weed out those fast growing corals uh, and allow other more slow, slower types of slower growing types of coral to actually colonize the reef and get a start as well without being outcompeted by all the pioneering type species. But what we have to remember now is that the, the frequency and the severity, severity of ble um, bleaching storms as well as crown of thorn starfish is, is being amplified under climate change. And as things warm up, we're expecting to see, you know, bleaching just about every year, some level of bleaching. So reefs are being Reduce, you know, coral cover is being reduced on reefs, irrespective of what we do with the COTS control program. So bleaching is essentially, you know, weeding out a lot of those fast growing species when it happens. If it happens and it's too broad and too severe and too, you know, widespread, then we've got problems. But the Crown of Thorn starfish program really fits into protecting those corals that make it through those bleaching events and helps the overall biodiversity and resilience of the marine park. Yeah, because biodiversity is, it's key when we're talking about the reef, isn't it? it? Is. Uh, the yeah. reef is one of the most biodiverse uh, ecosystems in the world. Indeed it is, yeah. It's one of the most biodiverse ecosystems for sure. Um, and that diversity is strength because 
not all species are impacted by disturbance events in the same way. So by having lots of different types of coral biodiversity, for instance, we have additional resilience in the marine park. Something that places like Florida and Hawaii don't have. They have quite a small number, less than 10, 15 species of coral or less. Whereas on the GBR, we have five, six, 700. Um, so that biodiversity that we have here is a real strength of this ecosystem. And so for that, we actually do almost need not plague proportions, yep. but that balance, that just yep. getting that balance right. Low levels of, of crown of thorn starfish are fine. Um, it's just that what we're trying to do is protect enough reefs for their important coral larval source value. So how does that balance between not destroying cots entirely mm. and managing an outbreak and protecting the reef? How do you yeah. strike that kind of balance? Yeah, it's a really great, great question. Um, you know, we are definitely not trying to eradicate these starfish from the reef. Um, we would, even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it with current technologies unless we were going to, you know, gene edit them out of existence or, you know, and why would we do that? I think it'd be completely soci sociologically unacceptable to do that, ethically unacceptable to do it. Um, but what we are doing is, is actually suppressing their numbers to low enough levels on specific reefs to protect the coral on those reefs. And by protecting the coral on those reefs and avoid, uh, avoiding those reefs being um, decimated by crown of thorn starfish, those reefs are actually better able to manage their own way through bleaching events and storms. So if we can protect the network of these reefs throughout the park, and at the moment we're targeting um, essentially 500 priority reefs of the 3,500 odd that are out there, we're targeting 500 or so of them for crown of thorn starfish control. And we know that those are reefs that are vulnerable to starfish control, uh, to starfish outbreaks. And if we can keep on top of the starfish numbers on those reefs, those reefs can provide very important sources of coral larvae, which after disturbance events can then be used to reseed and replenish the reefs that have been degraded. So is that what makes them a priority reef? Because we obviously yeah. we'd like to say that we can protect every reef, hmm. but the priority reef, they're the reefs that will help uh, yes. the reef recover from from you know, weather events and all of those sorts of That's things. That's correct. Yeah. So um, anywhere that we've identified as a really high value coral larval source reef, so the corals spawn and they produce babies and those babies drift on the water column and they uh, disperse to downstream reefs. And then they settle, those little baby corals settle and they grow and they replenish that reef. Um, so any of the reefs that we've identified as important coral sources are places that we would upweight in the prioritisation process. Similarly, places that are important for um, propagation and perpetuation of the crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, they're places that we're upweighting in the prioritisation process too. Um, then we also have places that are extremely high value tourism reefs. Um, and they you know, to help to sustain the tourism industry, we need healthy coral. So we would also upweight high value tourism reefs in the process as well. So we've been touching in every answer on the work of the program. Mm. Let's talk broadly, what is the, the Crown of Thorns um, Starfish Control Program? What do yep. you do? Mm -hmm. Why is it in existence? And yep. tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, well, um, you know, cots were first detected um, in the GBR. People really started first observing them at places like Green Island in the 1960s. Um, so people have really been doing some sort of cots control since all the way back then. And initially it started off with people with a metal hook gun, hook it up and put it in your boat and take it to the beach and burn it or whatever. And it was, it, well, A, it's dangerous because they're spiky and they're venomous and difficult to handle. Um, but it's also really in inefficient uh, way to do it. So over throughout the 1960s, 70s and 80s, we kind of tried a whole lot of different methods to, to cull these things and they tried cutting them up and, you know, what you end up with is lots of these starfish arms which then propagate themselves and regrow. Because that's right, they, they, they actually can do that. You, yes. It's not, I'm going to cut you up, that's it, your history. No. They Cut it in half, it makes two starfish. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's <laughs> yeah. just, it's a, yeah. it's an evil enemy to have. Isn't yeah, they're, it? they're pretty yeah. amazing animals. They're highly evolved, you know, and very, very capable coral predators. So, um, yeah. So through the seventies and eighties, we were trying all sorts of different methods. In the nineteen nineties, um, they started using injection methods. Um, so where they inject a, a solution, uh, they were trying all different types of chemicals and stuff to inject them and kill them. Um, so you didn't actually have to bring them out of the water and put them on your boat and take them ashore. You could just actually kill them in situ. Um, then, you know, we tried lots of different things. 
like that, but these days we use a single shot injection of household vinegar. So it's that that simple after all the chemicals, mm. it's vinegar. Vinegar. Yeah. It's the cure all. So how do you, you do that? Well, what we do is we actually contract um, vessels with teams of divers and a typical dive team would be eight divers. Um, and we deploy those vessels throughout the marine park. So by putting those divers in the water and methodically working our way through reefs, we're able to A, identify where the starfish are and B, use the single shot injection method to go through and effectively cull them. So, you know, some of the previous methods, they had to inject starfish multiple times. And for every second, the divers taking an extra shot and having to, you know, re-squeeze the trigger and do all that, all those seconds add up and it becomes less and less efficient. So these days with a single shot, the divers work in, in lines and they work along the reef slopes uh, and they go along and they see a starfish or a scar, a, a, a scar on a coral where the starfish has been feeding. They'll then have a quick look around for the starfish, see where it is, give it a quick shot and then move on. And the whole line of divers moves through a site like that. Um, in order to put those divers on the right spots around each reef, we need to first survey the reef. Um, so the first thing we do when we arrive at a reef is actually to do to deploy a method called Mantito. Um, and that's a method that's been in use for decades. But essentially, it's a, you have a small boat, a tender from, from your main vessel, and you have a 20 metre rope with a manta board on the end of it, which is essentially a, a board about that big with your data sheet and stuff. And an observer will hang onto that board and be towed around the reef. And we do that in two minute blocks all the way around the reef. Um, so then every time we see scars or crown of thorn starfish on one of those two minute toes, that would then trigger us to open a cull site. And each reef is divided into cull sites and they're all set up in um, GIS kind of um, uh, mapping. So we know exactly each cull site has a code. We know where the divers are being sent. And then we know how many diver hours are invested in each one of those cull sites to bring that particular aggregation of cots under control. So with that many divers and boats on the water, mm. how many cots have we actually been able to cull from the reef through the program? Well, thousands of starfish in a day. Um, but that depends on the density of the starfish on that reef. In many reefs, we'll go through and we'll survey them and you'll see a few scars and you'll see a few cots and you put your dive team in and we'll, we may move through that site, which is approximately 10 hectares each site. And we would typically get somewhere between 50 and a couple of hundred starfish in that site. But there's sometimes we will get in and we, we could get six, 7,000 cots in one site, one hectare, hectare site. So they're very, they can be very aggregated and very concentrated they're not evenly distributed around most reefs. So why is that? What, are, what is it or what are the conditions that make a COTS outbreak mm. and sp specifically on certain reefs to, to have mm. that difference where one area may, you might get one or two, yep. and then over here you, you're knocking over a thousand. Yeah, that's right. And well, we don't really know all of the contributing factors and there's probably multiple, but number one is there has to be the right types of coral that they really like to feed on. That's you know, fundamentally, if there's no food there, they're probably not going to be there in those sort of numbers. Um, so that's probably condition, condition number one. Um, there's also um, certainly strong evidence that places where there's the right type of settlement habitat, when the crown of thorns larvae come in and they settle to the reef as it, from the plankton down onto the, onto the seafloor, they need the right sort of habitat to settle into. So when an outbreak starts, all these little babies come in and they might come in in a big batch there might be thousands of them arrive in a certain on a certain night of the year and then they hide in the rubble and these sort of recruitment habitats until they grow and eventually they start after months to a year or so they start to switch from feeding on some of the other stuff they're finding in the rubble to live coral and once they start feeding on live coral they quickly start to grow and they quickly move disperse out from that settlement habitat to the essentially the adult habitat which is predominantly on the reef slopes around most reefs, which, which are the areas that are sporting the most coral. So lots of coral and proximity to settlement habitats is probably one of, a couple of the big factors. There's others. Now, there's something I heard a long time ago, and I don't know, this is one of those myth busting, and it does mm. get asked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, how many crown of thorns, I won't call them babies, but... How many can one crown of thorns spawn? Millions. That was what I yeah. had heard. And I just thought, Millions. that's not possible. So yeah. every crown of thorn that we are removing yeah. is taking away the potential for millions more. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, they can grow huge. So I, the biggest one I've seen and 
other colleagues have said, Dave, we don't believe you. You didn't see one that big. But the biggest one I actually measured with a tape measure while I was doing a, a brief survey one year um, was 94 centimetres. So, so it's almost a metre. It's almost yeah. a metre in diameter. It's That's absolute, huge. Yeah, huge animal with like 15 to 20 arms on it and just this giant monster. Um, so you can imagine a starfish like that eating that much coral. And if that happened to be a female, the amount of eggs a giant crown of thorn starfish like that would produce would be tens of millions, possibly even more than 100 million eggs. So how long could that crown of thorn starfish actually live for? Um, I... I, they can certainly live for at least 10 years. Yeah. Some may live for – something like that may have been around for 20. So it's not just – they don't just sort of pop up and then no. die within a year or two. They're, no. they're big. They get yeah. bigger. They, they grow, they grow pretty big. Yeah. They grow, grow – you know, early on they're growing pretty fast and then their growth starts to slow down as they get big. Most of the ones we're dealing with on the reef are around about dinner plate size. When they're sort of smaller than 15 centimetres in diameter, um, they're actually not very efficient to cull. Um, we're better off actually just leaving those ones there but noting that they are there and then coming back in another year or so when they've come out a bit because they're, they've, they can be very, very cryptic and very difficult to find. So when they're small, they're very difficult to find and as they get bigger, they become easier to find. So when we're talking about you know, being as efficient as we can with the dive teams and, and really you know, having the procedures in place that mean we can be as good as we can be, um, it's, it's worthwhile excluding those, those sub-15 centimetre starfish. So you've talked about how it's more effective mm. to wait till they're a little bit bigger mm -hmm. to cull them. Um, when you're looking at the process of how you do go about culling them, mm. and you said you use vinegar, yes, that's something that it doesn't have an impact on the reef itself. Is yeah. there any particular reason why we've you know vinegars? I use it to kill mould everywhere, <laughs> but um, is there some reason why we we went with vinegar? Yes. Um, Prior to vinegar, we were using ox bile salts. Essentially, you take the, the stomach acid of a cow, you dry it out and you turn it into a salt, and then you mix that back into a solution of seawater and you inject that into the starfish. And there was a lot of work that went into doing that. And it was a real breakthrough because suddenly we were going from this multiple injection method to a single shot injection method. Um, and it's just one of the examples of why it's so important that the Crown of Thorns program is informed by the best available science. And so we work very closely with our uh, research agency partners, um, the universities, the Institute of Marine Science, the Commonwealth Science Industry Research Organisation, CSIRO. Um, and the data and information that's coming out of many programs is informing what we're doing uh, with the COTS control program. So that's just one example. So the single shot injection method was a real game changer for efficiency. So there is a lot of research that's going on in the background, but it's not just that we're out there in the water trying something, seeing if it works and then absolutely. moving on. There is that, that really heavy science background to yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And so progressing from the ox bile salts to vinegar was just the next step. Um, and the reason, to answer your question, the reason why we're going with vinegar these days is because it's cheap, it's readily available, and it stores forever. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's also safe. You know, fundamentally, these things have to be effective and they have to improve our efficiency in the water, but they also have to be safe for all of the other animals that are on the reef that we are there to protect. And so vinegar is just one of those products that works. Yeah, it just yeah. works. And we only need 20 mils of 20 millilitres of vinegar um, injected into a crown of thorn starfish to kill it within 24 hours. Now, more broadly with the program itself, mm. you had the, the COTS control program, mm -hmm. but it is not, it's not just the Reef Authority involved. No. This is a, a mm. multi-agency yes, program. Um, what's, how does that all work? What's the, the involvement there? Well, um, as I was saying a little earlier, you know, the program has sort of developed and expanded over several decades, but right now, and probably since 2012, we've had a really committed investment from the federal government in doing this. Um, so that's allowed just a, a gradual step up in capacity, efficiency, and all of the science that's informed it to the point where we are now. And right now, as of 2022, uh, we have a government uh, funded commitment through to 2030 on the COTS control program. And it's part of a broader investment in the protection and management of the reef. Um, so the Crown of Thorns program sits within that investment, and that's been the most secure and long-term investment that the Crown of Thorns starfish has ever had, and that's going all the way back to the 1960s. So over these last five decades, we've seen four outbreaks of Crown of Thorns starfish. 
So this current outbreak that we're in now is the first time that we've actually had the capacity, the resourcing, the, the funding uh, security, uh, and the people involved and the support across multiple agencies to actually do it properly. So the Reef Authority lead the operational program. But as I said, we rely heavily on the science that's coming in from our partners. We work closely with the state government through the uh, Department of Environment and Science and the Reef Joint Field Management Program. Uh, and we also work very closely with the Australian Institute of Marine Science. So these, these groups are out there doing work on the reef all the time. Uh, and we use the information that they're gathering from the reef to inform what we're doing in the program as well. So it's a real partnership program. It is a real partnership program. There's other industry partners, you know, the Reef and Rainforest Research Centre, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. These guys are contributing to various aspects of the program. Plus we have our contractors on the water and um, they are doing an outstanding job. And while we are out on the water doing this, mm -hmm. the research isn't stopping, is it? No, it goes on. Um, so the current... Most of the Crown of Thorns starfish research going on right now is actually happening through what's called the COTS Control Innovation Program, and that's being led by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Um, and that was um, funded through the Reef Trust Partnership, which was money that was announced several years ago. Um, so that research program is very much focused on providing outputs and information that can be directly integrated into the, into the operational COTS Control Program. So it's very applied focused research, you know, very clear objectives. Um, and so we're, we're receiving outputs from that program all the time. So when you're talking about the value of the program, obviously removing COTS, mm. it's what we can do. Mm. But this is one of the key management actions, isn't it, that we mm. can actually use and we use year round to help protect the reef mm. and to help reduce the stresses on the reef um, so that it's in a better position to be mm. able to cope and we're, we're heading into summer obviously yeah. mm. which is a tough time yeah. on the reef itself Indeed. but cots removal is it's one of those key actions we can take mm. to get in there and to really target areas to help them in that process that's right um you know it's one of the actions that we do in the marine park there's lots of actions that we do um and as i said you know the cornerstone of our management is our zoning plan and and that's a world-class marine multiple use zoning management plan um, and it's been used as a model all around the world so but that that zoning system is fairly static what we're doing with some of our other management systems is much more dynamic we can we can respond we can react and so a real value of the cots control program is is not only the fact that we're able to suppress starfish numbers and protect coral on this network of connected coral source reefs which provides us um, you know increased resilience um, and increased ability for the reef to bounce back from disturbances. More coral means more coral that make it through these bleaching events, make it through the through the storms, uh, and they're the ones that will replenish the ecosystem during the recovery phase. But is also just this program is generating a massive amount of information through all the survey work that we do. That information is used not just for the COTS control program, but also to uh, provide in water assessments of things like our aerial surveillance when we're looking at the extent. Um, of bleaching events, coral bleaching events, we provide a good chunk of the in-water assessment. So you've identified from an aircraft, you've identified a, a reef that's bleached. We then can put a team in the water and actually run the manatee around that reef or do some other surveys on that reef, take some photos at least, to um, actually sort of quantify the severity of the bleaching actually on that reef. So it really is a, a key part of the authorities' uh, reef health program, particularly Absolutely. over that summer period, but it doesn't stop. No, it just keeps going. We run all year. But, you know, the summer, summers are always busy and it is a stressful time for the reef, you're right. Um, and, you know, this, the world is, is getting warmer and we are running into a very warm summer this, this summer. So we're expecting the summer 23, 24 um, to see bleaching on the reef somewhere, someplace. We don't know how severe or extensive it will be, but we expect that we will see bleaching on the reef this summer. Um, and it could be quite severe given what we've seen in other parts of the world. Um, in recent months. Um, that said, you know, it's been known for at least a decade that we can expect bleaching to be an annual event, um, you know, by about 2030. So we're on, on track to that. There will always be some bleaching, but the ability of the ecosystem itself to adapt to the impacts of those bleaching events and for the strong corals to make it through those bleaching events. You often see a situation where you'll get a bleach 
this coral colony here of the same species will survive while this one here of the same species will die. And we don't exactly know what it is specifically about that coral that made it lived when its cousin, brother, nephew died. Um, but whatever it is about that special coral, we want to try and propagate that. So if we then let a crown thorn starfish come and eat that coral that survived, then we're losing whatever it was that was special about that coral. Now, when we, we talk about bleaching, the one thing that we do need to be clear on is that bleached coral doesn't necessarily mean the coral is dead. No. So it's a sign of stress instead? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, when the, predominantly bleaching occurs because the water gets very warm and corals have uh, plants living within their tissues. They're called zooxanthellae um, and they're a microscopic uh, algae. So when the coral gets very warm and the water gets very warm, that algae starts to die. And rather than letting that algae die within its tissues, the coral will package it up within each little polyp that makes up that colonial organism, which is a coral colony, and it ejects those zooxanthellae out, gets rid of them. So when it loses the algae from its tissues, it's actually becomes the tissue becomes transparent. So what you're seeing there is that transparent layer of live coral tissue, still alive, but sitting on top of a white skeleton underneath. Um, now, if that coral dies, the, the tissue will slough off. And then quickly there'll be um, turf algaes and other things start to grow on the dead coral skeleton. But while the coral is bleached, it is still alive in the early stages. And if it doesn't die immediately, it can regain those zooxanthellae algae and go about growing again. It often sets them back in terms of growth or reproduction, but they can certainly survive. So that's part of that critical time yes. then to ensure that you don't have a whopping great big crown of thorn starfish wander over and just devour that. That, yeah. that coral has something that is, makes it stronger or yeah. more capable. That's yeah, right. That's so the ones that make it through, we want to protect those ones that make it through. And then over time, over multiple years, multiple generations, across a whole network of reefs connected by larval connectivity across the entire marine park, we can help to select, help the strong ones, essentially keep, keep them from being eaten by crown of thorn starfish and help those strong ones be the ones that then propagate their own offspring and the ones that supply larvae to other reefs in the park. And we can do that, that's one thing we can do at scale. And we, we've not demonstrated that we can actually achieve that yet, but in theory, that's possible. And if we can control starfish on enough interconnected reefs and actually have this really effective network of coral larval connections across the park, we can potentially have a quite a big impact in, at the scale of the entire ecosystem. So when we're talking about coral cover, um, a lot of people sort of expect that, you know, coral cover should be 100%, mm -hmm. but 30% is actually really good. And it's that, that bit of confusion around what constitutes yeah. the right amount of coral. So. Yeah. 30% is a good... It's it's on par with average that we've seen across the park since the 1980s. Um, you know, when we survey a reef, we go all the way around a reef and some parts on that reef will have potentially 100% coral cover, but parts of that reef will have much lower coral cover. It's like if you're in a forest and the whole thing is not trees. There's also shrubs and, and grasses and other things that are growing between the trees. It's a bit the same on a reef. Um, and reefs can be very, very patchy depending on if they're orientated towards the, the direction that the wind is coming from or if only they're on the sheltered side of the reef, the coral communities and the amount of coral that can be sustained at a site level can be actually quite varied around a reef. So if we look across all of the reefs that we monitor routinely, you know, around about 25% coral cover, live hard coral cover, is about the standard that we've seen since the 1980s. Because something that people often get a little bit confused about is that a reef is not just coral, is it? A reef is made up of, you know, coral is a significant yeah. part of the reef, yeah. but there's more to it than that. Oh, there is. Um, you know, there's, there's areas of rubble, um, there's areas of sand, um, there's areas of essentially consolidated limestone rock. Um, you know, not all of it is coral. The coral grows in the places where coral does very well and, and you know, dominates those areas. But there's other areas of the reef which are not really conducive to coral growth. Um, and if you think about in a lagoon, some people that have swum through a, 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 a lagoon will see you'll get a patch reef and then you'll get another patch reef and we'd refer, refer to these sometimes as bombies. And then in between you have sandy patches. And it's not that those sandy patches aren't valuable. In fact, there'll be sea cucumbers and all sorts of invertebrates living in those sandy patches as well. So that contributes to the biodiversity of the park. 
In fact, that whole range of habitat types, even on an individual reef, is part of what gives it, it its unique biodiversity values. And it's that biodiversity that makes the reef strong. That's right. Indeed it does. Going back to looking at the summer ahead, mm-hmm. and obviously it, it's something that we are all very conscious of, mm. um, the, the the world is warming and that does have yeah. an impact. Mm-hmm. But is having the Crown of Thorns starfish, um, having the program, the people in the program, the divers out there in the mm-hmm. water, is that giving us a also the benefit of a really good picture mm-hmm. as to what's going on? Because the, mm-hmm. the reef itself, it's, it's huge. And I think a lot of people don't ever really Im- sort of get that picture of, what is it, Just 70 million this. football fields. So it's a yeah, massive it's area. Mm-hmm. So is it like having those extra expert eyes and ears on the ground feeding back into us? Every bit of information we get from the reef is valuable. Um, So there's been, you know, originally it started off with very few people actually out there in the water and it was really only in the 1950s and 60s where people put, you know, a bit of glass in front of their eyeballs and got out there and started looking at the reef. And then the invention of scuba gear and, you know, people being out on the water and spending enough time out there to really observe what was going on. So it's ramped up over the last 50, 60 years. but yeah, these days we have more capacity on the water than we have ever had before. You know, between the Institute of Marine Science, the Reef Joint Field Management Program, the rangers that are out there doing stuff, the community groups, the citizen science groups, the tourism industry, the fishing industry, and the Crown of Thorns Starfish Control Program, there's a lot of capacity out there to collect information. And one of the things that's really been a game changer in recent years is um, the ability to collect reef condition data using imagery. So being able to go out and snap photos of the reef and then rather than laboriously looking at each one of those photos and having a human say, oh, that's live coral, that's dead coral, that's algae, you know, which takes forever and that's the way we've done it for several decades. Now we're putting it through uh, machine learning artificial intelligence platforms which are able to do that. So the Institute of Marine Science has developed something called the Reef Cloud. Um, so we're, it's able to process a huge number of Im- images very, very quickly and generate coral cover estimates, coral composition, community composition estimates, all sorts of data can be drawn from these AI platforms. And it's not the only AI platform in development. We also have one that's being used to detect cots. Um, So at the moment we're using the Manitou method and and human eyes to to actually see the scars and see the animals so that we can, again, steer the cull effort to the right places at the right times. In coming years, we're probably gonna have um, semi-robotic at least, platforms collecting that data for us and fully robotic AI systems actually analysing the data for us. So that's going to give us more and more capacity, but we still need the people on the water to drive those machines. And we, we're not going to have robots in the water going and doing starfish injection because it's just not efficient. Where humans are very, very good at seeing the starfish when we're moving slowly on scuba gear and able to do the single shot injection, it's actually a very efficient method. So we're probably not gonna be getting rid of the actual manual control, but the detection and data collection stuff of reef condition will probably increasingly, will will increasingly transition to image-based and AI analysis over the next years. But we certainly have more capacity out there on the water now than we've ever had in the past. So for the people who live around the the reef coast, specifically around Townsville, there's been a a huge success story mm. um, on one of the reefs not far from here, John Brewer. Is John that Brewer a, Reef, yeah. So can you just just to sort of yep. give an, us an idea of what you started with there mm. and where to now? Because I think that's a, a really lovely sort of case study as yeah. to the success of the program. Yeah, well, you know, we've, we've actioned hundreds of reefs over the last decade um, and we've protected, you know, over 700,000 hectares of reef habitat from cots predation. So it's a big area we've, we've managed. We're generally getting to about somewhere in the order of 200 to 250 reefs per year. But John Brewer is an important tourism reef and it sits pretty close to Townsville, just out to the east here. Um, and when we looked at the long-term data set for John Brewer Reef, which was collected by the Institute of Marine Science Long-Term Monitoring Program, we can see that John Brewer has been hit by crown thorn starfish in all the previous outbreaks that we've observed. Um, and in those times, the coral cover on the reef has been actually dropped right down to about three or four percent. So only three or four percent of the entire reef surface is covered with live coral. The rest of it's pavement um, and covered in turf algae and other things, um, but not live coral. 
So in the current outbreak, that's the first time we've been able to deal with Jomaru, and we know it's been one of those reefs that's difficult to control. It takes a lot of effort to bring it under control, and it took us the best part of of three years of repeat visits. Not the only reef we're working in that three years, but we had to stop in at that reef over three years and, and revisit it about 60 times. Um, but we culled um, upwards of 65,000 starfish just off Jomaru Reef. But instead of the coral bottoming out down at three or four percent cover it's actually bottomed out at about 15 or 16 percent and so when you when you look at that and you think okay over time we haven't stopped all the coral cover because it was such an intense outbreak but we've just stopped a lot of it and we've stopped it from bottoming right out at close to zero so from 15 or 16 percent it can quickly bounce back up and get back up to where it was before the outbreak at 30 to 40 percent um, and it can do that in about four to five years rather than taking 10 to 12 years going from 3% back to 30, 40%. So the, we're influencing the recovery trajectory of coral on these reefs by suppressing the outbreak, reducing the numbers to sustainable levels, and then allowing coral to regenerate and recover. And just a bit of a clarification there, most people sort of think a reef would be 100% coral. Yeah. But it's not. No. <laughs> it's, so 30% is actually a really good coral yeah, cover about, on a reef. it's about standard. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about average. Actually, the average across the entire marine parks in the 20s, often around about 25, um, for all the reefs that we look at, which is not all the reefs, but it's a, a good proportion of them. But you know, what you usually find, like crown of thorn starfish, coral is also very patchy around individual reefs. So an individual reef could be 10 kilometres long, could have a circumference of 20 kilometres or or more. Um, they're huge. And so there'll be areas of those reefs where you may well have 100% coral cover, and you can have 100% coral cover that extends over hectares. Um, but then you can have other areas of the reef, which is 80%, 70%, 10%, you know, 0%. And then so when you look at it over an entire reef and you do mandatoes, these little two-minute toes all the way around the reef to get you, give you an estimate, you're getting a full range of values all the way around that reef. So, yeah, there are a few very small sort of pinnacle reefs, which would be truly 100% coral cover. Um, and in fact, some of the reefs even fairly close to the coast, like um, Middle Reef, just between Townsville and Magnetic Island. There's been times where sections of that are definitely 100% coral cover. Um, and you wouldn't think so because it's in this grubby Cleveland Bay right here, yet there's plenty of coral there. Um, but yeah, the standard, if you look at you know, individual reefs and by region and by the whole marine park, it's usually sitting around about 25% coral cover, live cover. And so to have got John Brewer up to that 30%, that's been a huge success It's story. a huge win. You know, and, and it was, for us, it was a real test case. You know, how much, how much control effort, diver hours, is it going to take us to bring this reef under control? If we don't give it a go, we don't know. Because, you know, we could have just said, this reef is looking to be a real recalcitrant reef. It's going to take us years to bring it under control. We're better off spreading our effort to some other reefs here. But we made a decision to stay and double down on it. Um, and now we know. We can do it. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to do it. Some reefs are very difficult to control. Others are much easier to control. But by doing it there and securing a really important tourism value reef offshore Townsville, um, we've demonstrated that we can actually achieve a lot. And so I guess it's one of those jobs that's just ultimately satisfying at the end of the day. For me personally, like after all my now decades of sounding old, but it's true. <laughs> um, you know, it is satisfying, you know, and I've been in research and consultancy. I've done big jobs for oil and gas industry and I've done lots of other stuff, you know, all around the world. But working for the Marine Park Authority and actually doing something every day that feeds into improved management of the Marine Park is hugely satisfying for me personally. I, you know, I'm again humbled by the opportunities I've had in life and I'm and, uh, and really thankful. Oh, well, thank you so much for answering the questions we have about COTS. And I'm, I'm sure I was just thinking how good it must feel to get in the water with that shot of vinegar and <laughs> just take those guys out. Yeah, so. You're welcome to come out and inject a starfish anytime you like. I will certainly take you up on that offer. Please do. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.